Welcome to Growing Up in Easton. Today is Wednesday, April 28th, 2021. We are still on Zoom because of the pandemic. And I'm in Easton and uh, Jeff Bergeron is a class of 73, is that right, or 72? 72, but um, <clears throat> I look very youthful. So yeah, I can see how you'd think it was 73. Yeah, mm -hmm. I understand. I have the same problem. Uh, and Jeff is out in Colorado, and Joe Povis is out in California, San Diego, to be exact. Welcome to you both. And uh, you. Joe, you were the class of 73, right? That's right. At All Rames High School. Be sure we say that. Okay, so tell me a little bit about growing up in Easton, what it was like, what kinds of things you did, uh, and who your friends were, and don't we can edit anything out that you might not want to broadcast. Don't worry about it. Okay. Joey? Joe, well, Joe, start um, with I think Jeffrey and I probably had a little bit of a different experience growing up, only by geography. I grew up in the center of town on Sheridan Street between Park and um, Columbus Avenue, which of course was very central to what much was going on in the community back then. Would I, I never took a bus to school, you know, walked to everything from grammar school to high school, downtown the Frothingham Park, which was a, you could have a whole hour on that alone. Um, the history, everything that went on down there, including the park scum, and uh, you know the going fishing at Fred's Pond, Long Pond, swimming at the town pool. And I think a lot of things came to that part of town, but Jeffrey is gonna to have to discuss if it was that different for him being, oh, he was in the sticks, man. You know, we didn't even know what went on in Pine Street and Massapog Ave and the Quantiket and that stuff. So probably a little different experience in terms of growing up, but we all had friendships. And once we hit junior high and high school, we all met the kids from the other parts of town and, and uh, you know, became friends with them. You know, that, that sums it up in a nutshell. Um, I grew up in, uh, well, I, I call it the suburbs of Eastendale <clears throat> because we weren't quite in Eastendale proper. And uh, I always perceived the, the kids in Northeastern as being much more sophisticated uh, than, than we hayseeds from Eastendale. Uh, but for, for me, my earliest times you know I was born in 53 so in the early, late 50s early 60s it all centered around a bicycle um, all of us that lived I, I lived kind of just just over the border of Pine Street of uh, Tur uh, Turnpike Street just by Pine Street and um, you had bicycle to school you had bicycle to the Eastendale school to uh, uh, to play sandlot you know football or baseball or whatever um, and uh, that was the case until until, like Joey said, we all, uh, I went to Parkview School at sixth grade, but from first to, to fourth, I went to Eastendale School, then the center school, and that kind of ended my, you know, we, we would still bicycle to the Eastendale School in the summertime to, you know, to play sports and stuff, but uh, yeah, it all centered around a bicycle, and probably like Joey, I didn't have to be home in the summertime until the street lights went on. You know, I think I guess has said that. I I think a common theme for probably everybody, and I have admittedly, if I don't watch the other broadcast, you know, there's a lot of things we all had in common. But I I think roaming, you know, we had free roam to go wherever we want without any worry about, you know, who I don't know what these perceived as, you know, dangerous people out there nowadays, maybe, and helicopter moms and dads. We didn't have any of that. We just said, we'll be back. We never told them where we're going. We're going to play baseball. I mean, you've probably talked about the floods up behind the plains and, uh, and just going through the woods up there and coming back at night from skating, um, you know, when we got home and, and uh, going up the flyaway pond to swim or the, or the, or the town pool, you know, uh, yeah, I'll see you later, mom. And, and <laughs> it was okay. Uh, you know, and I can, I can, growing up often for a while, we had one car in the family and my dad would take the car to work. And like, huh? sometimes I would, I would hitchhike to little league games, but I mean, to little league practice. My mom would say, well, you know, dad's not going to be home for a while. 
uh, what do you call it? The Plains was wasn't that the Little League field? Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah they would, we would have different practices either at the park or the or Southeastern Grammar School, and I'd hitchhike and never thought anything of it, and it often get picked up by my friends' parents. Yeah, you know, one of the memories I had, of course, um, in the downtown area was the bus that ran from Brockton came into downtown Easton, came down Main Street to Center Street, up Columbus Avenue, took a left on Sheridan and a left on Spooner. And the bus driver lived on the corner of Center and Spooner down, down there. And I think it was Mrs. Miss Heath's father, the, the school teacher. He'd park, have lunch. And if we wanted to sometimes go to Brockton, we'd get on the bus, we'd wait for him, for him to finish his lunch, get on the bus and, and head over to King's in Sears. And then uh, you know, it was, I remember being there, and now how are we gonna get home? I don't know when the bus ran. And we sat on the rock in front of, by Sears. And, and I said to people, there was two or three of us said, you know, are you going back to Easton? You going back to Easton? There you go, so can we have a ride? And, and we'd get in their car. <laughs> who knows who they were? <laughs> I forgot all about Kings. That, that, that I had like this deja vu of shopping at King's, holy, that's, that's, holy smokes, cool. Yeah, yeah. but back to Easton, but we didn't go any, I didn't go any further into Brockton because then it got really dangerous. Um, well, so, so the bike was really your mode of transportation uh, and also uh, hitchhiking, hitchhiking. Um, and you had so much independence. Uh, what were other situations in, in which uh, your parents let you be independent. I'll I'll tell you a story that I just I just recounted. I was in Utah camping with some friends of mine that had had kids. Uh, my wife and I don't have children, and they talking. You know, they were just keeping an eye on their kids. I'm the youngest of six, and my mom went into the hospital when I was a little kid, and it was bef- obviously it was before kindergarten, so it had to be like I was either four or five, four probably. And my mom went into the hospital and all my siblings would go to school in the morning. My dad would go to work and, and my siblings would get up. I'd have breakfast or something and they would, they would go to school. They'd lock me out of the house. And then I would be on my own uh, all day. I'd ride my bicycle to, to the Julian's house who lived down the street, or I'd ride my bicycle to the East Adele school and play on the swing set, which I, I could do that until recess. And Mrs. B shell would say, no, you can't, you know, you, have, you can't, you know, the kids are coming out. And I would go to Freddie Anderson's house. Elaine Anderson uh, still is in Easton. Uh, Freddie Anderson's house for lunch. And he was a cop. And uh, his, his wife would make me a peanut butter sandwich and I'd hang with Freddie at lunch. And then uh, I'd be off on my own till I think my siblings got out of school at, at three or something They let me back in the house. And we had a, an aunt that would come and cook us, cook us dinner and my mom was in the hospital for a week. I mean, right now, parents would go to jail for that, you know? You know, one of the things, Jeffrey's story is, you know, the Yulians, they have three very attractive daughters who are very, very nice. Yeah. And he left that part of the story out that were yeah. our age. <laughs> so there's no flies on him. Sometimes I would play hide and go seek and I'd, I'd hide at the Yulian's house. <laughs> no, that, that he didn't want to be- that, that lady who made you that peanut butter and jelly sandwich uh, is a cousin of mine. Phyllis? Yes, Phyllis. She, her maiden name was Swanberg, and her brother Charlie Swanberg, too. And um, Phyllis lived a long life. She, she passed away last year at the age of 95. And um, hopefully I inherited those genes. But her grandmother and my grandfather were siblings. And that was on the Almquid side. Um, so, but she was one of those people who would just take everybody in and feed them. And that's a very Swedish thing. And I'm sure it's the Portuguese thing too, and the Irish thing, but it's really the Eastern too. Yeah. And it was that time when we trusted everybody and there was no doubt in anyone's mind that every adult was actually our pseudo parents. So yeah. when, right, and they had every right to correct us, discipline us, even if they didn't know us. Can you yeah. imagine today what would happen? It'd be a lawsuit. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's true. 
Yeah. You know, you know, you're talking about the Andersons. Um, Freddie Anderson, Phyllis's wife, was just an amazing craftsman. He could do everything, mm. including cut hair, um, which he that was his least skillful things because he knew one style, which was turning me into a cue ball. It cut all the neighborhood kids' hair. But anyway, he'd make swing sets and teeter totters and swings in his yard. And so all the kids would go there. But sometimes he would work nights and sleep days. So there'd be like six or eight kids in the in the Anderson's yard playing like we would we were mute. We we all we knew we could play, but we couldn't make any noise because if you woke up Freddie, you were in trouble. So all these kids running around playing tag like like we were from Gallaudet University and couldn't speak. <laughs> you know, Elaine, his daughter, Elaine Anderson Sears. She uh, lived in that house now. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was and two houses down from the Andersons. Did, did Freddie ever teach you how to uh, train a dog? Did he ever train your dog? Because he was magnificent at that, and he taught Elaine how to do it. And now she's retired from the town, um, and she's she has a uh, dog service where she trains dogs, but she boards them and so forth. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so what... what uh, Joe, tell me another uh, juicy story now. We've heard some from Jeff. Let's hear something from you. An amusing story? Well, you know, one of the things I, you know, I have a lot of memories, and as I was thinking, preparing for this, as a paper boy, we all would, there was a bunch of paper boys who would meet downtown in front of O'Connor's news store and wait for the papers to be delivered from Brockton to be given to, I think it was his name, Sal, who ran the papers in the back of O'Connor's. And in the meantime, you know, there was, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 kids waiting for the papers to come in. Sal would then come out, count out that, okay, Joe Povis and my brother Tony would have a, a paper out up, up in our neighborhood. You know, we needed whatever, what you know, 35 papers and, and, and he'd count them out, here's your papers. And we'd put them in our sack and put them on our bike and then go deliver them. But in the meantime, we're just waiting for the paper the truck to come in from Brockton, we'd all just hang out and harass each other. We'd go next door to um, Tom Barnhill's. Remember, there was an era where we bought paper clips and rubber bands, and we sat on either side of the road and winged them at each other, you know, cut them in half, split them in half like this, put them on our elastic and aim at each other. You know, I think we really could shout out an eye, and it was just fun, you know, <laughs> and try to hit each other across the road. Um, it, it was just a, you know, a, a nice time and, and the memories of, of uh, you know, going up to the library. As I remember, a kind of a sign of spring. In the wintertime, they put a whole wooden walkway from the door of the library down to, main, down to the steps of the library for the wintertime going up and down that steep slope. And when the wooden steps went away, that meant winter was over. And then the same thing happened with the Frothingham Park. They locked the gates in the winter. You know, it's closed, you're done for the season. Of course, boys, we could climb under through the gate. In front of Buddy Worcester's house, there was one picket that was bent. It's and it's still bent. And we could squeeze through it to get into the park. But of course, you didn't want to get cut. So we wanted to cut through when we go to the grammar school to school. Um, and then when the gates opened again, and, you know, winter was over and spring was here. So, you know, those were those were kind of nice memories. And then we all had track across, you know, through the snow from the Sheridan Street gate to the Day Street gate. There was kind of a path that we took all winter long to, so we didn't have to go the long way around. So that was uh, that was something I thought of thinking about our growing up. And, and nobody discovered your footprint in the snow? Yeah, everybody at least saw them. They saw them. The adults weren't going to chase us through the through. They didn't want to go through the snow. They, if we figured out a way, they let us do it. And I can remember you could, if you didn't want to go through the picket fence in front of Worcester's house, which is pretty much tempting fate. Uh, where Tanner Ford was, there was a gate at the at the park, and you could just vault over it because they it was like a chain link, but the chain links were low, so you could just kind of crawl up and put your belly on it and flip over. And it was like, like no gate at all. I mean, you pretty much had run out of place and it was all pretty innocent until 
high school and then then things got a little bit bit edgy but yeah it was always kind of like the spirit of the law and in the the letter of the law and we kind of adhered to the spirit of the law in many cases but i don't know i i didn't i couldn't really i i didn't get exposed to the park and all of northeast and until i made friends in northeast and like joey and his brother and billy rollins and some of those guys and that was probably junior high for me and that's when the park scum was formed in that era that's right which, yeah which had a yeah. known reputation of you know there was a group <laughs> of kids. and they're all you know they're all good kids they were they were a little bit more edgy than i personally was um you know we, we won't tell all the park scum stories but there was there's, there's probably a bunch of them that i don't i'm sure i don't know and then about uh I, how many years ago not it was probably a good 10 or 12 years ago one of them Mark Anacleto had a reunion of the park scum down at his house down the Cape. And it was such a nice time that was, you know, so many people showed up. And I look at the pictures I took, and unfortunately, there's probably four or five of them that are gone now. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, that's uh, Jed Casey and Joey Gaultier. And uh, most recently, uh, Dennis Horn just passed. Dennis Horn yeah. just a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, you know, they, they had their more share of. Well, getting in, you know, trouble with, with the authorities, but nothing that was significant no. or, you know, huge. It was but, troublesome. But, but I will, I'll, I will say this, and I, and I, I would bet you Joey will, would concur. It was a gift growing up in Easton at that time. Uh, and probably, it maybe still is, I have no idea. It's been gone for a while, but there was, there was no dichotomy of wealth you know the, some parents were a little bit more successful than others but pretty much everyone dressed the same joey's father with a was a, a barber my father had a, had a small trucking company everyone was pretty much the same there was a sense of innocence a an acceptance and a uh, availability of of getting around either by bicycle hitchhiking or whatever and it really was i it, it formed i mean i'm I, I know it formed my life and my my worldview, and I'm guessing Joey is as well, even though neither one of us live there right now. You know, one of the things I was thinking of when you talk about our high school years, um, in 70, well, they built the new high school, which now has been renovated, but the, prior to it opening, the class of 72, they had split sessions, yeah. uh, they call them double sessions, for about half a year until the school opened up and Jeffrey's class was the first one that actually went through a graduation ceremony in that school. Yeah. My class was the first one that went through a full year there. But prior to that, when we were at the old high school on the top of Columbus Avenue, I can't imagine if this was going on then. Jeffrey, you remember how many bomb scares there was? I mean, yes. two, sometimes two or three a day. And an actual bomb. And a bomb. Yeah, yeah, that, that blew up the... Uh... Uh, that d damaged the visiting team locker room. And I can remember, I can remember Muzzy saying, well, that was a horrible thing, but Lisa didn't take out the uh, our locker room. Lisa, Lisa was only the visiting team locker room. <laughs> Priscilla, have you heard the story of that? Some others have talked about it at all? No, no, I've never heard that. And what kind of a bomb was it? I mean, was it a Molotov cocktail or what was it? Oh, no, 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 this was a pipe bomb. It blew the windows out of the the, the the visiting team locker room had had a set of narrow windows at the you know maybe 10 feet high on the on that side of the parking lot that faced the the parking school all those windows came out i mean it was the lockers were bent and i mean we, we kind of know who did it to this day i, I think jeffrey and i kind of but it's know. safe to say the person that that shall not be named uh, that that was involved it was something they did that they thought would be a harmless prank, but they just didn't have the engineering skills to realize that a, a small amount of gunpowder confined in a small container, confined in a locker, confined in a small room had uh, exponentially uh, a lot of power. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, I think we can safe to say that no one was more surprised than the perpetrator <laughs> of the damage. You know, I, and I, he didn't fill it with like BBs and nails and stuff to, to hurt people. I think it was just the, the pipe itself. Yeah. Or he, he, he or she. Yeah. Um, 
and uh, it was quite, and the rumor was the FBI came up there. I have no idea if they actually did or not, but it, you know, if that happened today and the bomb scares that they got two or three times a day, I think it was simply because people didn't want to go to school that day or they had a test. So call it in. <laughs> and you know, it also, the, you know, that was a, that was a horrible thing. And, and that was a, a big mistake. Whoever did that, but yeah, sure. a lot, a lot of times, this is before caller ID. So people like you say, <laughs> Would, yeah. would, would there was a there was a, a payphone in the high school and they'd have like a a test in in they would sometimes just call the front office and and so and, and say there was a a bomb or something and and it was this was like 70 70 70 71 72 so that yeah. was kind of going on it was copycat i mean i i don't condone it but it it was i i don't think the people doing it realized this, the the gravity of what they were doing and to, and to add on to that, the period to that period of time, the kids that smoked, the high school actually let the kids have a smoking area. They went out the back of the school, out the back back of the new sections that added onto it, and the kids were, were permitted to go back there and smoke. And then yeah. there was a there was a sunken window with a grate over it. And if you wanted to really abuse some kid, you lifted up the grate and shoved them down there and locked it. And the kid the kid was in it until somebody with a key or, or a bolt cutter could come in and undo the, the lock. But it was permitted. Yeah, the kids are going to smoke. Let's give them an area to do it. But Joey, I don't, I didn't see much, neither again, I could, it could be a Pollyanna observation. I didn't see a lot of bullying, uh, real bullying in the school other than, I mean, all, I had a lot of older friends. And when I was a freshman, they always, they threatened to, they kept threatening to put me in that grate. You know what I mean? But it was, yeah. it was, I didn't see a lot of, you know, but there again, I, I think both of you and I probably didn't suffer from it. I'm sure it existed, but it, it certainly wasn't condoned and it wasn't rampant. They, they, you know, one Jeffrey had the benefit of having some big brothers who are pretty well known in the tourist and, and tough. I'm, I'm, I'm holding my words back and very tough men and big brothers who are very tough and sisters who are well regarded in the high school. So he had a little bit of that protection. I had an older brother. Oh yeah, especially one of them in particular, um, Mark, who was, who was <laughs> had his own, if he got on, he had his stories. Yeah. I remember as a freshman walking into the high school by the gym and going towards my locker and there was three or four big freshmen, like um, the, the uh, Roy Olson type of guys who sat on, who stood on the side and one day they said, they were just standing there says, well, let's grab a freshman. And I happened to be in front of them when, they when that word came out and they grabbed me and they put me against the wall. You know, these were big, you know, more edgy type of guys. And I said, oh shit, what's gonna happen to me? Oh, and uh, all they did, they put me at the wall there and then they said, okay, keep going and, and, and let me move on. But it was just, this, this, it didn't go beyond that. Like, you ever catch the perpetrator? How good was the FBI in those days? No, that no. is no, no, no. no. And you know, and you know what? Till this day, I have not told anybody uh, who who I thought it was. I, I just figure I don't I don't know what the statute of limitations of that stuff is, but but no, they never they never caught the they never caught the perpetrator. But it was it was uh, it was uh, the whole that whole era of bomb scares and then an actual bomb. Um, that was quite a, that was quite a thing. Someday, Priscilla, when we're offline, I'm going to have to tell you another story about uh, <laughs> the genesis of uh, McMenemy's Hamburger House on Washington Street. But that's a story that it's all, that's completely offline. Um, and it's, it's not repeatable. But you, you know what? Another <laughs> thing I'll add on a, on a brighter note. Um, to this day, I can look back and think of teachers and coaches, coaches that made a, had a profound, I mean, I never went to college. I'm like, I, I stopped 12th grade with my, was, was my pinnacle, but I have teachers and had teachers and coaches that made a huge difference in my life. I can remember uh, Muzzy, uh, Lemish, uh, Jimmy Bugis, uh, Steve Trombley, uh, and just some amazing, mostly coaches, but they're also with teachers that we were blessed in that regard. And, and, and uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure it's the same way but like, at least for me, because I think my education ended at that era, they were both mentors, father figures, disciplinarians, and 
really, it, to, you know, I, I, I look back and I think I was, I was lucky. We were lucky to be in that school system at that time. Jeffrey, think about Muzzy giving the, the kids the keys to his car to go run errands, <laughs> right? I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah, Muzzy had a, he had a white Ford Falcon. And, and you could say in the middle of school, it's, hey, hey Virgie, go to, I've always said uh, Sartell's, uh, oh, uh, Sandy Sartell's father's business. Uh, anyway, they're broadcasting. Hey, Virgie, go to, go to Sartell's and pick up a bunch of uh, practice jerseys in, in the middle of school. He was, he was just a wonderful man and, and uh, had a profound influence on my life, as did a lot of the other teachers and coaches. Tell, tell me, Jeff and Joey, um, what was that profound influence? What were some of the lessons you learned, the principles that you lived by because of those guys? For me, it was, a, it was, it was accountability and an and a, a aspiration of behavior and cause and effect. If you worked hard at something, for me, it was sports. I, I wasn't much of a student. If you worked hard on something, you'd be rewarded with, with performance. And, and if you, uh, I'd say courage and also compassion to the, to the kids that, that uh, you know, that were a little bit smaller and, and uh, uh, just cause and effect. I, I, I think those guys, and, and also, I mean, a lot of us that didn't have a whole lot, you know, six kids, our parents were busy. They provided that mentorship and the role model. I can remember I got caught cheating on a, I caught you get cheating on a, a, a Spanish test and, and uh, I get kicked off some, I had to take a suspension for some sport. And I, and I, and I told Bugus and, and I said, well, if I didn't, if I knew you were going to give me a hard time about it, I wouldn't have told you. He goes, I think that's why you told me. And it, you know, just stuff like that. And he was, you know, I was probably 16, 17. He was probably 25. He wasn't that much older, you know, you know, he'd be a young man, a kid to me today. I think he's still he's uh, he's down the Cape. Last I heard, um, I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there was um there was there was a lot of teachers. I I was not into, I was not a, a guy that played sports. Um, so though even those those guys were were teachers and and um, and coaches. Even though I wasn't on their teams, they still treated everybody. If you weren't an athlete, with respect and wanted you to do well. Um, in other ways, in, in, you know, in the classroom as, as, as best as you could, as, as you could or do your best. And they mentored you that way. There's still a, um, a teacher that I'm still friends with to this day, Fran Iolente, um, that I, you know, I text and, and uh, he's going to turn 80 this year. And uh, it comes, he comes to my house. I go out to lunch with him once a year or so. And, uh, you know, still a friend and uh, taught all my brothers and sisters. And, uh, you know, there, there's, there's, uh, you know, having him as a friend is, is very important to me still. Tell me something. Um, your careers, I know, um, uh, Jeff, you're Miss America. You're quite well known in the Midwest. And I want you to tell us how uh, we can tune into your uh, programs that you, you have a blog. You also write a column weekly for your local Colorado paper. Um, and and you said, you know, you never went beyond high school, but you obviously got something from your teachers and, and all the mentoring, and you just blossomed, You and your potential was buried there, and then it just blossomed, and, and you produced so many wonderful programs. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, you know, in, in, it, all, it, it all started with a teacher in sixth grade named Mrs. Harden and and didn't uh, Mr. Harden teach school too Billy I mean Joey yeah I, th I think yeah, that was a science teacher yeah so anyway I was in sixth grade and I you know I went to East Israel school then the center school then sixth grade and Mrs. Harden noticed that I had a speech impediment some sort of you know I just had trouble saying certain words and uh, I had a little bit of stuttering and there was like a visiting elocutionist that would come and I'd go and it was first it was a stigma I mean it was like embarrassing I'd leave the class and go work with this gal and and you know and we worked on some things and she kind of got me involved and made me feel comfortable with public speaking um and and so then it you know so I was a little bit more comfortable and then I worked in the restaurant industry which as a waiter in my in my late teens and 20s and uh, in California and in Colorado and in New York 
Uh, and then uh, uh, when I, I started doing a little, they had amateur nights and I'd do some stand up comedy and things like that. And I started writing, uh, writing ad copies for radio, uh, radio shows and doing uh, voice uh, voices. And uh, then I kind of fell into the, the whole uh, uh, Biff America. I started out when there's 13 channels and there's 500. So even, even I could get work. So yeah, I, I did that. Um, I, I stopped doing TV about 10 years ago when I had to put on makeup with a paint roller. But uh, I, I, um, I write for uh, a few different magazines and newspapers and magazines out here. I write for a national magazine called Backcountry. But it just it was just kind of catch as catch can. I, I, uh, I you know, I. Yes, yeah, so I, I have two books Yeah, and that uh, were published by this publishing company that I, I write for uh, that write for magazines. But I, um, yeah, I, I don't want to uh, mislead the, the viewing public. I was very I was very small time. I. My claim to fame, I had some, some syndicated work and some local work and a, little, a couple of national uh, exposure. But for the most part, my big claim to fame was I, could, I made a decent living for 30 years doing mostly freelance, writing TV, radio. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm by no means a, uh, a Stephen Colbert as far as my, uh, my exposure. Uh, Joey, Joey was much more successful in his chosen field than, than I was for sure. I'll, I'll I, 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 I want to say, I, I want to say one thing. Jeff. I read, um, I have read some of your weekly uh, uh, posts on, the, you know, the newspaper posts, and they're really wonderful. And they always have a, a lesson to learn. And uh, from what Joey said to me, you have incorporated a lot of Eastern in some of those. Uh, writings. So I think you should tell us what's, how do we get in touch with that? Tell our viewers so they can get more of um, Easton and your, you know, your remembrances. Yeah. You know what? I, th I think um, uh, I, I write a lot of ski stuff, but that's that, that was on height of land publication. That wouldn't really interest a lot of people in Easton, but you could go to the summit daily news.com summit daily.com and just punch in Biff America, and, and you know you'll get more columns than uh, you'd ever you'd ever care to read. One column I wrote recently was about the Wilbers. Uh, I changed the name just because I because uh, um, they had a, they had kind of a, a junkyard and stuff. And and when we were little kids, talk about talk about lawsuits. There was a cable over a pit where he'd put refrigerators and all this other stuff. It was a cable over a pit. And we learned about it from the trailer park boys. And there was a few like, m like meat hooks on pulleys. And so these kids, we, you know, myself included, and uh, would, would go to this cable and, and just kind of was like a zip line. And you'd have to jump out before it hit the, the next tree. <laughs> and, uh, it was just strung between two, two trees. I wrote about that. I wrote a lot about Easton and my 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 dad uh, and my my parents growing up and and there's there's some there's some things in there that you might uh, be uh, sound familiar. I wrote okay, so about Mrs. B Shell. So give us the um, the address again. It's Summit Daily News, SummitDailyNews.com. Okay. I'm guessing, yeah. Yes, yeah. Summit S U M M I T. Daily. Yeah, daily. SummitDailyNews.com. News. Com. That's, dot com. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so everybody check it out. Now, Check it out. I want to say, when I, when and he, also he goes by Biff America. Now, where did that come from? You know, um, when I started out, I was I was writing ad copies and, and doing doing voices for radio, uh, but I was mostly as a waiter. And I moved to I'd, I'd work in Colorado in the winter, and I'd bicycle to California in the summer. And I was living right on the beach with these three guys named Buzz Bones and Skip. And, uh, and, and here I had a two syllable name and, um, I said, well, this is not going to work. If, if, if we're going to, if, we're, if I'm going to live with these guys, I got to change my name. So I just, I just kind of picked out Biff and this is well before, uh, back to the future. And then I was doing, but that, that year I was doing uh, voices for a radio show. And, uh, there was this kind of a stodgy judgmental guy that was kind of down on everything in this ad copy I was doing. And I just tacked on Biff America. And then when I started doing a uh, stand up and, and MC work, uh, Jeffrey Bergeron was just, it just didn't have the ring and Biff America did. But I have to say it sounded very cool 
in my 30s. In my 60s, it's like a bad tattoo. So <laughs> okay. I, I will say when I when I when I worked, I did at one point work on Monday mornings, I would go in and I would pull up his column because they, they went out Sunday night, Monday morning. And quite often I would just start laughing. And the people that sat around me go, What are you laughing at? It was Monday morning, you know, it's the start of the work week. There's nothing funny yeah. about it. and and I would say this stuff. I mean, it was some of it just you know, downright hilarious. And, and you're right, they always, most always have a moral ending to them. I mean, his columns to me always was, a, was kind of a Mike Barnacle type of flavor to them when uh, Mike Barnacle used to, used to write. Yeah, and that's great. what it always reminded me of. Yeah. And, so uh, so tell, tell me how Easton influenced your career. For me? Yeah. Um, I, I can't say that it did. I, you know, actually, yes, the, my link is this. You know, I spent 30 years in the investment industry. I started at Fidelity Investments in 1983. I'll tell you how I got the job was that um, you know, Fidelity at the time was managing about $20 billion, which was nothing. I think, I don't know how much over a trillion they are now at this point, maybe 2000 employees. We used to see Ned Johnson in the elevator, but I was looking for a job back then. I was in Boston hanging out at Faneuil Hall area. I ran into a girl that I was in high school with, Carol Dre. Um, same class as me, the Dre family, very famous. They sort of ran or lived on Wheaton Farm up on Bay Road. And uh, I told her I was looking for a job and she was working for Fidelity at the time. And her friend that was with her was working in human resources. And they says, come in and apply for a job here. You know, we'll, we'll help you out. And, you know, because I met her in a bar at Daniel Hall and I went in and I did apply and they hired me, you know, I went through the process and I was hired. And that was sort of the start of my career at Fidelity. So my influence is, a girl from high school I met in a bar in 1982 or so, 83, and, and 30 years, I stayed with it. Did you say that was Susan Dre? No, Carol, Carol Dre, D-R-A-Y. Oh, okay. right. And uh, the, the Dre family um, had, a, had uh, several kids, uh, Mark Dre, um, Bobby Dre. Um, Bobby Dre was quite an athlete too, Jeff. Remember they used to have the, yeah. what was it called? The Presidential uh, Fitness Test? Yeah. that they, they would administer us in, in, in gym class. And it was uh, some standards, Jeffrey probably came very close, but, but Bobby, Bobby Dre, what was it? Which was the it old It was the Marine, Marine Corps fitness test. Yeah. And I think that you, to get an 800, you, you excelled in everything. And he was yeah. the first in high school history to, to pass, you know, 800 points. And they announced it on the intercom in the morning. Yeah. And yeah. He was, he was like the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, who is the guy that's now a woman and not the same, you know, in California. Jenner. Yeah. Jenner. Bruce, yeah. Kind of a decathlon. Bruce, was the Bruce Jenner of all the Rams high school. I mean, did, Joe, sure. did you go to, did you go to Stonehill? I did go to Stonehill. Yeah. yeah. But this is something I want to ask Jeffrey because I didn't experience it, but it was legendary. And I'm sure Priscilla people have talked about it, but the high school football team going from the high school to the park, you know, in you know, two by two, wearing cleats, living on Sheridan Street, growing up, you know, not in high school, you could hear the the high school team when it, they were leaving the high school to go play whoever it was down at the Farthing Park. You could hear the cleats from up on Western Avenue start to come. And I, Jeffrey experienced. I I didn't. I just heard it. And then once they got closer to Park Street, I, did you start a you start a, a chant or something? I, I I'm not sure. But but the other part of it, and you can tell that story was. The Frothingham Park at the time for the high school games growing up, they put canvas across the fence on Sheridan Street, if anyone's ever talked about, so that nobody could see the game and not pay yeah. through the fence to get through the gate. And the high school teachers would man the gate. And then at halftime, the tickets came down and you could go in for free. And of course, we didn't have enough money that I could pay for a football game when I was growing up to go see it. I had to wait till halftime and try to look through the canvas. But that was... Jeff experienced that, which I've never really asked someone, you know, what that was like to do that walk. It was, it was like a, a, a gladiator. I felt in there again, you know, you, 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 you have all these misnomers and, and naivete at that, that age. But I had like this misconception that I was doing something really honorable and, you know, representing the OA Tigers, you know, walking down two abreast. And there again, I lived for that. I, I wasn't a good student. I had you know, other, other, other challenges. Uh, but that was sports was, for me was, was my salvation and, and my identity. 
and it, and there again, the, the, the coaches were wonderful and, and, uh, the camaraderie and, and you know what, it's kind of opened the door for kind of a, to, a, to kind of reconcile or uh, to reintroduce Facebook. I've met so many of my old friends and classmates via Facebook, you know, living out West and, you know, you kind of lost touch, but that's been a, just a, a real, a real joy for me. And none of us have aged. No, no, no. no. We just you have know. a little less hair. Yeah. Let's hear more wrinkles. <laughs> no, when I was, uh, I graduated uh, Jeff, with your sister, Callista, yeah. who was the oldest because you're the baby. Yeah. And um, when, you know, there was never a charge at Fathingham Park for a football game, a baseball game. It was always free. And oh, really? uh, yeah, nobody, everybody, and we, you know, the, the stands were full, always full. That's the one thing that Easton community really supported all the sports and uh, came out and um, yeah. So, um, I and you know, as, you know, what's interesting is, is something I've, I'm proud of about Easton is, um, uh, or, or one thing, my brother, Michael was one year older than my sister, Callista, but they graduated together, but That's we right. had amazing, um, emphasis on female sports too, uh, with Sue, Sue Ravad, uh, we, and, and, and there again, while other, while other schools kind of de-emphasize, Easton was very, very uh, supportive of, of, the, of the, the lady sports, the women's sports. Yes, and that was true back in uh, the 50s. I graduated in 1960 and played basketball. Um, and um, although it was that half court nonsense, but yeah. my mother, uh, Enie Larson, um, was, she is in the All Frames Athletic Hall of Fame. She was the best forward in all of New England time and her best friend Helen O'Neill who lived next door and they were best friends until they died uh, she was also uh, inducted posthumously um, because in those days in the 20s graduated 1929 in those days women sports were really big I mean really big and they played men's rules so they had they did full court press everything uh, the only thing, I think, I don't know about the men, but if somebody scored, it would have, the centers would tip off the ball. And Sonia uh, Carlson Ma uh, Martin, she was really tall. She had those Abraham Lincoln arms and legs. And she always got the tip off. And it went to Helen. And Helen got it to my mother. And when my mother shot, she never missed. So when they... Tanya, uh, it was 1929, I think, and they were playing the state, the state championship in Ware, Mass. And Sonia got food poisoning the night before. Maybe the other team, you know, <laughs> responsible, who knows? But not Sonia couldn't play. So they, I, um, all the Reigns should have, won, you know, won that game and been the champions in, in 29 but they only lost by three points. And it was 31 to 28. And who do you think scored all 28 points? My mother. No Enid. way. Yes. And that's because Helen O'Neill would set them up. But unfortunately, without Sonia uh, tipping off the ball after every basket, um, they, they couldn't sustain the win, so. Hey, there was one, I was very good friends with uh, Elaine Anderson. <clears throat> but also Lee Anderson, and we used to go to yep. the uh, to the gal ba lady basketball t games. And a cousin, and I think it was Stromberg, that might have been related to you. That was no, a Swanberg. phenomenal, uh, a, a, a gr amazing w a lady athlete. I and I thought she might have even gone to school, a uh, college, and played. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Well, Linda Swanberg, she was a year behind. Uh, she was class of '61. So I don't know if you, you knew it. She was a very, a very good athlete and she was the center on our field hockey team too. She was a great, okay. yeah. She had a sister too, um, as a sister, uh, Phyllis. Yeah. And um, so, and they were both good athletes. Yeah, yeah, Ann, I Taylor, can remember. Ann Taylor was a uh, class of 58 and I played basketball with her. She was a phenomenal player. Uh, yeah. yeah, but unfortunately in the fifties they did this half court crap uh, which, you know, only two of the 
uh, forward could cross over the center line. And my mother, who you know played men's rules as a you know athlete, she would attend my games, and she was she was just so frustrated and upset. <laughs> My, my God, this isn't basketball. This is tiddlywinks, you know? Okay, let's get back to you guys. So, um, so Joey, you uh, worked at Fidelity your whole career? No, no. I Well, no, I, I worked there about nine years, and then I worked for several other investment firms in downtown Boston. I spent just about 30 years doing it. Um, back office operations kind of... Um, uh, I was a compliance manager, make sure they stay in compliance with the rules and regulations of the SEC, the New York Stock Exchange, and, you know, mm-hmm. try to try to have clean sales and, you know, a clean industry. And, and uh, that well, was they, my. They didn't hire lawyers to do that back then. They usually, if you want to, they, if you want to get up into the senior parts of being a compliance person, you always needed, they always wanted to have a, a lawyer, uh, an, an attorney's a law degree, but you didn't need it to do that job. No. Mm. You know, my wife is a compliance, you know, compliance director, chief compliance officer for the uh, private equity firm that she works with now. But she is an attorney. But um, you don't need to have a attorney, you know, be an attorney to have that job as a compliance director. But they just like it as credentialing. The SEC likes to see that you have an attorney in that role. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I, I'm a retired lawyer, and um, I have to say that um, the excellence in education. <laughs> Thanks. I know. I mean, after 20 years, you get tired of all the um, uh, Boy, oh, lawyer jokes, stress, the stress, the stress, the stress. <laughs> but, but I got to tell you, it was Easton's uh, level, high level of education. And I think you guys touched on that a bit. Um, that really helped me uh, to become the person I wanted to be. And I started out as a school teacher and then I went to law school. Uh, I was involved in all those 60s uh, campaigns, civil rights, women's rights, anti-war um, movements and so forth. And that's what compelled me to go to law school. But I think it was the education and the striving that Joe, uh, Jeff talked about, you know, that you had to do your best, you know, performance that counts. And you stick oh. with it. You don't give up. You persevere. And um, I was valedictorian of the class. I mean, that didn't hurt uh, at all, brain. But it was really that um, excellence in education that you got. I mean, I don't know if you had Miss Foster for English, but anybody who had her, uh, and there have been a lot of people on this show that have mentioned her. Uh, she was Miss Perfectionist, and um, nobody fooled around in her class. But what we learned was just wonderful. And even Muzzy, and I had him for biology. You know, we could start talking about football and get off the subject of biology. That was easy. <laughs> but we still learned so many wonderful principles have kept in life, life's principles from Muzzy. And I'm One sure of, you have other teachers that can, you can talk about. My sisters talk about, my grandmother was at 92 Center Street, um, directly across from the St. Max Church. And the house directly looking at her, my grandma's house to the left, um, two doors down from, from Bridge Street, was an Ames house, they tell me. Um, the Ameses bought it for this, for, uh, I wish my sister could, but they bought it. It's either the principal of the high school lived in that house, but they remember when Muzzy came to town and him moving into that house and having a room in that house um, before he was married. And, um, you know, he was just, he was just this new teacher in the school system. Um, two other teachers that I didn't know, but I knew of one was, was it Willis Smith? Willis Jeffrey? K. Smith. Yeah. Willis, Willis K. K. Smith, Smith. Was, yeah. who was a wonderful character. Uh, he died unfortunately too early in life. I think it was a, a, a you know, heart attack when he was, yeah. when he was young. And then we had Fran Gasha who was, you know, yeah. followed up with him and, you know, a wonderful personality and, and, you know, a lot of you know he, those are two two names. Doc Harrison is a math teacher. Um, we're all great uh, mentors and to all of us. You, you know, and I t- to hear you guys talk, uh, uh, Priscilla, and your your involvement in in worthy causes and uh, the anti-war, uh, feminine, uh, female rights, and whatnot. 
you know, and I, I do know, and I, we should talk a little bit about Joey's involvement in philanthropic uh, giving organizations, his involvement in volunteering. And I think Easton did kind of bleed that into our psyche about giving, you know, kind of to each according to their needs, from each according to their ability. Joey, Joey is involved in, uh, or was involved in, in supporting a convent at one time. He puts up pictures of Facebook with him, him and all these nuns. And they're not like the scary nuns that used to teach us Sunday school, but they really just nice nuns. And I, and I, I really think Easton kind of planted that seed. And I'm involved in some stuff as well, but planted that seed in philanthropic, giving back to the community, yes. be it a, a, a huge cause like, like, uh, like feminism or a small, uh, a small cause like a convent or a school or a park. Yep. They're yep. actually cloistered nuns up in Los Altos Hills, California, 19, 19 cloistered nuns. So I, I still to this day call my girlfriends and they said, oh, we're the kind of girlfriends your wife likes you to have. Because <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't leave. But, yeah. uh, you know, you mentioned I went to Stonehill and I'll tell you one of the things that, you know, thinking about my experience there, the students that were at Stonehill really know nothing about Easton. And probably my little secret was when I would go there and there was a bar in, on Stonehill called Brother Mike's. There was actually a Brother Mike and uh, it was in the basement of the boys dorm. And, you know, you, you'd tell girls there was kind of the townies. Right. And, and they yeah. were, you know, growing up in Easton. But it was always a good line to say, you know, have you ever seen Easton? Has anybody showed you in Easton? Oh, no, I've never seen Easton. I says, okay, let's go. <laughs> and, yeah. and these girls, I'd take them on a tour of Easton. I never took boys. But, uh, you know, and, and it was always a, a nice opening to get to know them and uh, show them the, the back roads and front roads of Easton. Because they really never did leave. They sort of, if they went to Brockton, they went over to Buddy's, um, to the Union Villa for pizza, or they got out to the Old Forge Tavern. That was about it. But the, the, you know, it, I think that still exists to, to an extent, though the administration is trying to get people to be more involved in the town. The, the last, last job I had in TV, uh, the, the network of the station was run by a Stonehill College graduate. Oh, yeah. and, uh, and, and I understand they changed their name from the Chieftains to the Skyhawks or something. But my exp experience with Stonehill was working for Muzzy's Camps. And uh, he had the Sam Jones basketball camp. And, Notre Dame football camps, but uh, Steve Barrett and I worked for his girls camps. And that was like <laughs> shooting ducks on a pond. I, I worked for the girls field hockey camp and the girls basketball camp. Uh, and I'd live, I'd live in O'Hara hall in the summertime. And I'd like say goodbye to my parents in June. And I'd say, you know, I'll, I'll come home to do my laundry, but it was a great opportunity for uh, it, it, in Stonehill. I mean, it's still, it's, yeah. it's just a yeah, cheerleader camps too. That's right. I did that too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, listen, uh, I, I want to thank both of you so much for remembering Easton. And, you know, you have really carried Easton in your hearts up, you know, till this day. And I, I think the influence that, that it had on you, and I know Joe wants to have a parting word, the influence that you had, that it had is, is just, it doesn't, it's not confined to Easton. It's not confined to where you are. Because the people that you meet, wherever you are, in your travels, you bring a little bit of that quality, that Eastern personality, that what Eastern, that innocence that you talked about, that sharing and that philanthropy. Because, uh, you know, I know that I give more than I, uh, than I should, than I, than I can afford. But I, I always feel that, but for the grace of God, walk I. I, I've got to, you can, I know you can edit this and everything. I got to tell you, it's a, it's a business that a guy, that Jeffrey's classmate, Jimmy Bourne, who has, based in West Bridgewater, and Jeffrey, I don't know if you know all the details of this. And Hilliard's was at one point, one entity of Hilliard's stores and Hilliard's chocolate making machines. And that split, I, I, I don't know what point, in the late 70s, early 80s, where Judy Hilliard and Charlie McCarthy, both one of Jeffrey's classmates, Charlie, took the stores. Jimmy Bourne, Jeffrey, if you know this, took the machines and developed it. And over up of West Bridgewater, kind of the old Bunsies, he has his business. And he makes these machines and he sells them all over the world. And one of the things I still do to this day, I did it last weekend, 
when I see a, a candy store, no matter where I am, I go in and I said, what machines do you have? Last weekend, I was in Coronado. I went in and he says, I, I, he's, I don't know, the guy said, I says, is it Hilliard's? He says, yeah. So I go over and I take a picture of it and I send it to Jimmy Bourne and it's a piece of home for me, no matter where I am. I've been up in Canada or up in uh, Lake Louise and I've gone into the, the, the high-end candy stores there and I said, Hilliard's chocolate and candy machines. This Jimmy, I send it to him. And he says, yep, that's a 1912, 2012 model. I've been in Disneyland here in Anaheim, right? Which is, to me is hell on earth because it's just horrible. But I look in the window, right? There's a dozen of Hilliard's chocolate candy machines making candy for Disneyland. And it's a piece of home whenever I see it. And Jeffrey, I don't know if you do this, but maybe you should, wherever you go, look for the candy stores, look for his machines. And I'm so proud of him. I said, you know, you can talk about Silicon Valley companies. I used to live in Palo Alto and Menlo Park. And, you know, I'd see Google and Facebook was downtown. Nah, Hilliard's chocolate candy machines have it all over all of them in my heart. It really Check is. Check that a, out. <laughs> yeah, it is so cool. good. It's such a good businessman. And it's so successful. And it's this niche business making chocolate machines that make the chocolate. Cool. Making lots of people very happy. Yeah. Have to check that out. Yeah. Well, thank you both so very much for being my guest today on Growing Up in Eastern. You have certainly painted a wonderful, uh, caring, loving picture of, a, of your hometown. And I think to uh, some degree that, that the same personality still exists here. Uh, people do care. Um, they rally around causes. Um, and, you know, they, we still have our town meeting. So people get a chance to express themselves. So it's, uh, you know, but that freedom, that independence. And I can tell the three of us are very independent. Uh, stem from that early childhood experience when our parents said, be home, just come home when the streetlights come on. And so I want to thank you both, Jeff Bergeron, if America, summitdailynews.com. We're all going to tune in and we and hopefully we'll be able to find your books on Amazon. And just you just need to Google your name and Joe, Joey, didn't know that. But thank you so much. The two of you have have great, um, uh, what's the word? Um, okay, I'm having a deep moment. Uh, uh, synergy. That's it. You have great synergy. Thank you so much. With Thank that, you. Okay. See you, Jeff. We'll, we'll, See you, Jeffrey. Go away. Go Take away. care. Go All the best. That was we'll fun. See you guys. It. It was fun. This is Priscilla Almquist Olson saying, hope you enjoyed this program as much as Jeff and Joe and I have, have uh, been producing it. Thank you for joining us today.